Hello, my name is Mike, and today I want to show off a pair of mods for Civilization V that I helped work on. They are called the Third Unique Component and Fourth Unique Component. The complete version of Civilization V with all of the expansions includes 43 unique civilizations. Each civilization has a unique ability and two unique components. For example, Morocco here has the unique ability that improves their trade routes, a unique unit, and a unique improvement. This is the same for every civilization in the game. A unique ability and two unique components. With the third unique component and the fourth unique component mods, each civilization has a total of four unique components in addition to their unique ability. So Morocco, in addition to having their first unique unit and their unique improvement, now also has a second unique unit and a unique building. Each civilization in the game has at least two unique units now, and at least one unique building. These new components are not meant to radically change the way a civilization plays, or to completely change gameplay. But hopefully these components will make each civilization feel a little more unique, and give you a little more insight into each civilization's history. In this video I will be going through each civilization's new components, and explaining how they relate to that civilization's win condition or gameplay style. I will put a link in the description to each civilization so you can skip to whichever one you want to view. Let's begin with Morocco. Morocco is a desert civilization that does well when it tries to go for a culture victory. Their unique improvement improves the defense of all units on that tile, and their unique unit fights better in homeland territory and in the desert. What this means is that Morocco predominantly does well when it's avoiding conquest and it's just playing a very peaceful game, sending out trade routes, turtling up, and building up culture. The two additional components that come with these mods include the Zalij Mosque. It's a unique version of the temple that improves the culture of each city by 15%. Basically, the Zalij Mosque rewards you for having tall cultural cities. Morocco's other new unique component is the Gumier, a unique version of the Musketman that gets strong combat bonuses on rough terrain, which is forest, jungle, and hills. As Morocco, you're probably not going to have a whole lot of forest or jungle in your territory, but you will have hills, desert hills. So if you station a Gumier on top of their Kasbah, then not only will they have the hill defensive bonus and the Kasbah's plus 50% defensive bonus, but also their Drill 1 and Drill 2 combat bonus. What this means is that the Gumier is the ultimate in defense. You station them on rough terrain around your city and enemy units will not be able to fight their way through. Morocco is uniquely qualified to create large cities in the desert, defending their terrain and going for either a cultural victory or a diplomatic victory or science victory also works, but preferably culture. Greece is a civilization that focuses on diplomacy, but also early game warfare. They have the Hoplite, a unique spearman, and the companion cavalry, a unique horseman. So with these two units combined, Greece is great for going for early game combat, and then about around mid game just kind of easing off and going for a diplomatic victory. But you could also go for a domination victory too. The two new components that Greece gets are the Peltist, which is a unique version of the Archer, and the Agora, which is a unique version of the Market. The Peltist is a unique version of the Archer that withdraws from enemy melee attacks, similar to the Incan Slinger if you're familiar with them. This means that if you combine it with the Hoplite and the Companion Cavalry, you will have a very strong early game army. In addition, you have the Agora, which gives you more gold from trade routes and just also an extra point of gold for each building. This will help Greece get more money to spend on city-states, to buy influence, and get a diplomatic victory. When you play as Greece, you want to eliminate any nearby rivals as soon as possible with your strong early game army. And afterwards, you can continue doing that, go for a domination victory, or you can ease back and go for a diplomatic victory, which would come very easily with that unique ability 
and now also the Agora. Assyria is a civilization that starts off going for domination victory, much like Greece, and afterwards they can continue going for it, or they can ease back a bit and go for one of the other passive victory conditions. All of their unique components, including the two new ones, come during the ancient era, meaning you get a strong foothold in, and then you go and decide what you want to do. They have the Royal Library, which is a unique version of the library that trains troops better, and the Siege Tower, one of the most powerful city-capturing units. They also now have the Royal Guard, which is a unique version of the Spearmen that's more offensively focused than defensively focused. You want to attack enemy cities with your Siege Tower, and they can be supported by your Royal Guard Spearmen. They would do very well together in early game warfare. They also have a unique version of the walls called the Walls of Sargon. They're just regular walls, but they get one production. Now, one production doesn't seem like a whole lot, but in the early game, that can be really powerful. There are no buildings in the ancient era that improve the production of your cities, except for the water wheel, which requires you to be on a river. This can be built in every city. It improves your city's defense, and it improves your city's production. Hell, might even double your city's production. Overall, Assyria is great for early game domination. Do what you want after that, but in the beginning, start plotting about how to take out your enemies. Songhai is a civilization that really comes into power around the medieval era. In the beginning game, you'll try and conquer barbarian encampments to get gold, and you can do a little bit of early game warfare, but you want to hold off until you get the Mandakalu Cavalry, which is a unique version of the knight that can attack cities pretty easily. They also get the Mud Pyramid Mosque, which is a unique version of the temple that just yields plus two culture. With the new mods, they also get the Sofa, which is a unique version of the Cross Bowman that can heal nearby units and can move after attacking. Because these two unique units come around at the same time, they really support each other, with the Sofa using their ranged attacks and healing the Mandakalu Cavalry, and the Cavalry doing a lot of the heavy lifting and attacking the cities. They also have the Treasury, which is a unique version of the market that, instead of yielding plus one gold in the city it is built, yields plus two gold in the capital. What this means is that your capital is going to be a very powerful trade center of the world, much like Songhai had one of the biggest trade centers in the world at the time. When playing as Songhai, you're going to want to have a strong military to begin with, but you also want to keep on improving your cities, building the unique temple and the unique market. And then when mid-game comes around, the medieval era, you start conquering, you take a couple of cities, and then after that you decide if you want to go for a domination victory or if you want to go for a more passive victory. Either one really, really works. The Huns are a civilization that focuses on domination. Domination, domination. It comes from the right from the get-go, replacing the spearmen, you get the battering ram. Great for taking down cities. You build two or three of them, and you just take them from city to city, taking them all. And you got the horse archer, a unique version of the chariot archer that doesn't even require horses. You take that around, you do some ranged attacks, you take down some enemy units, you take down some cities, you just start conquering. And you conquer for the rest of the game with the strong head start you get right from the beginning. Their new components include the centaur, which is a unique version of the knight. So the horse archer does upgrade into the centaur. What this means is you don't have to lose all of your bonuses when you upgrade the horse archer to the knight because the horse, because the horse archer now directly upgrades into the centaur. The centaur has a promotion that causes nearby enemies to fight even weaker. So you get all of your bonuses, you upgrade to the centaur, it's an even stronger version of the horse archer, and you keep that domination going. Their new unique building is the yurt. It's a unique version of the circus that doesn't actually require horses or ivory. It doesn't sound like much, but it also increases the rate of border growth. So you burn nearby cities, and then you take over that territory passively. Overall, you start with a very strong military, and now you keep that military going, and you take over as much territory as you can. Rome is another civilization that does great with early warfare. Their unique swordsmen and their unique catapult 
come both during the classical era. So you get a decent start in the ancient era. Once the classical era comes around, you build up your military, you start conquering, and after that, you just kind of ease back and you go for some kind of passive victory. Although you could go for a domination victory if you so desire. The biggest thing with Rome is you want to have a strong capital with a lot of buildings because that gives any of your other cities a production bonus towards the building those similar buildings. With Rome, you always want to go wide. You want to have a wide strategy, build a lot of different cities because they get a, they get a production bonus in all those cities. Their two new components are unique buildings that help in different ways. The Forum is a unique version of the market that increases great people generation in a city. This is mainly beneficial for the capital because the capital is probably going to be the city that generates great people the most. It's, it's okay for other cities, but it doesn't really give them the same bonus as it does the capital. The Thermae is a unique version of the garden that, in addition to generating great people, also has food, science, and culture yield. So they are great to build in all of your other smaller cities. If you have access to fresh water, that is. This means that the overall strategy as Rome is going to be a little bit of early game warfare, and then very non-specific bonuses towards the end means you can go for any kind of passive or aggressive domination victory if you so desire. It's really open-ended, do what you want. Germany. Germany's unique ability starts right from the beginning of the game. You start defeating barbarians, you build up a land army by doing so, and you pay less for land maintenance, which means they're great for early game domination because you can just throw barbarian troops at the enemy until they fall. Because you'll be focusing on defeating barbarian units in the early game, that will help you get a lot of influence with city-states. You might actually go for a diplomatic victory. That is also supported by the Hans, the existing bank replacement that gives you a production modifier with every trade route with city-states. So Germany is focused mainly on domination, but also a bit of diplomacy. The tank comes pretty late in the game, the Panzer, but it's really strong, and if you're going for a domination victory, this will make it go a little bit quicker near the end of the game. But there's kind of a dead area in between the early game and the late game, where if you're going for a domination victory, there's not a whole lot of advantages you have. Well, now you also have the Teutonic Knight, which is a unique version of the Knight that converts defeated enemy units. Think of it kind of like the Ottomans' Corsairs, where they conquer nearby ships. Well, the Teutonic Knight conquers nearby enemies and adds them to your empire. So if Japan and Rome start a war with you, you can send your Teutonic Knight out and conquer their troops. And once they're defeated, they will join your empire. So you will get samurai and legion. So you can have barbarians and uh, your normal German swordsmen and just have a whole bunch of different unique troops on your side. It'll be a, a pretty interesting army you could forge. And then once you unlock rifling, you can get the Jaeger. So you can upgrade all of your barbarian troops, all of your conquered enemy units, the <laughs> Roman Legion, the Japanese Samurai, everything that you've, all the melee units that you've conquered can upgrade to the Jaeger, which is a stronger version of the Rifleman, gets the survivalism and scouting promotions that the scout normally can get, and it can go down the recon unit promotion trees. So hopefully with these two new unique units, Germany can be a bit more interesting during the mid-game. You don't have to just focus on having barbarian troops, you can have a very interesting army. The Celts are a domination and religion civilization. Their unique ability means they will probably get the first religion of the game. And if they don't, their unique unit, the Pictish Warrior, will defeat enemy units and get faith as a reward. So you will get faith very quickly. And when you're conquering enemy cities, you can build their unique version of the Opera House, which gives plus three happiness. Now that's quite a lot and rewards you for going for a domination victory. Their two new unique components are the Carpentum and the Roundhouse. The Carpentum is a unique version of the Horseman. It's a melee unit that comes in the Ancient Era. And you might be thinking, I'm going to be spending all of my time in the Ancient Era building Pictish Warriors. Why would I want to build a Carpentum? Well, yeah, the majority of your military will be Pictish Warriors, but you want to have at least one or two Carpentums because they come with Medic and Medic 2, 
which means if your Pictish warriors get damaged, you just set them to heal nearby a Carpentum, and they will be back in action in one or two turns. You'll, your army will be much more unstoppable that way. The unique building, the Roundhouse, is a workshop that yields one culture from every forest tile in your territory. By the time you have the workshop available, you're going to want to start improving your forest tiles. It means you're going to lose that plus faith bonus that you get from your unique ability. But with the Roundhouse, it kind of balances that out by giving you plus one culture instead. You can use that culture to pursue a cultural victory if you want, or you can just use it to get policies to improve your military. The Celts have a pretty well-defined beginning. You go for a religion, you go for a bit of domination and conquest, but afterwards it's kind of open-ended. You can do whatever you want. You can keep doing domination, or you can go for culture. You can really just do whatever you want. Poland is widely considered to be one of the strongest civilizations in the game, specifically because you get a free social policy for every era. Poland is geared for a domination victory, with their unique version of the stable giving extra experienced mounted units, and their unique mounted unit, the Lancer, doing a lot of damage against enemy units, forcing them back. But you don't necessarily have to go for domination when you're playing as Poland, because that extra free social policy per era means you can fill out any of the social policy trees and not really have a setback. Their two new unique components don't really support any specific victory condition. Their unique castle gives an extra plus two food in the early game and plus two tourism in the late game. So you could go for a tourism victory if you wanted to, or you can just build up your food and have a very populated city for a science victory. They also have a unique version of the fighter called the PZL-23, which can operate at further distances and destroys enemy land units faster. Combine that with the Winged Hussar, and both unique units are great at destroying enemy troops. Not necessarily the best for attacking cities, but what it does mean is that as Poland you will be defending your territory very well, especially with that new unique castle. You can go for defense and then choose any of the victory conditions you want because they're just that versatile. Russia is a civilization that doesn't have any specifically defined victory conditions. When you're playing as Russia, you tend to want to go wide so you can get as many horse, iron, and other strategic resources as possible because you get double quantity of those. And if you settle a lot of, a lot of cities, you can build their unique barracks, which increases the rate of border growth, so you can take over a lot of territory the faster you build these, the more territory you get by the end of the game. Their unique unit, the Cossack, is a unique version of the cavalry, which does better against enemy troops. So you could use it to go for a domination victory, or you can just use it to turtle up and, and defend yourself against any attacking enemy units. Now they also have the Streltsy, which is a unique version of the Musketman that gets a Homeland Guardian bonus. They fight better in Homeland territory. So by the middle of the game, by the time you unlock muskets, it's going to be very, very difficult for the enemy to conquer your cities because you'll have this unique musket man who has this Homeland defending bonus and probably was trained at a city that had a Kree post and it'll be very difficult to take over Russian cities. Because you'll have a very wide and expansive territory that's difficult to conquer by enemy units, you're probably going to want to start turtling up near the end of the game and going for a science victory. That's what Russia's AI usually does anyway, is go for a science victory. So their new unique building is the Research Institute, which is a research lab that yields an extra four science. Now you might be thinking, at that late in the game, plus four science isn't that much. But you do that in every city, and you include all the bonuses from the other scientific buildings, and that plus four science can go a long way. Again, there is no well-defined Russian victory condition. You just want to build up a big, wide empire, and then you'll be pretty much free to do whatever you want. The Persian civilization is another civilization that doesn't really have any well-defined victory condition. They are the master of golden ages. They last longer, and they get bonuses from having golden ages. Their unique version of the bank yields plus two happiness, which helps them get their golden ages, and they have an immortal, 
which heals more quickly than the spearmen it replaces. You can use this unique version of the spearmen to defend and turtle up in their territory and just build up your civilization. Because of your unique ability, if you are going to attack somebody, you want to do it, you want to do it during a golden age because your units get plus one movement and plus 10% combat strength. So your immortal, which already heals at double rate, can be much, much stronger. You can do a lot of early game warfare and then kind of ease back and go for any kind of peaceful victory condition. Now you also have the Klibinari, which is a unique version of the Horseman, which is much stronger, but also has a movement penalty, only moving three spaces instead of four. But if you attack during a Golden Age, it has that plus one movement, which counteracts that. So you'll go back to having four spaces. You can combine the Klibinari with the Immortal and do a lot of powerful early game warfare. Do it all in the ancient era, take out any neighboring civilizations, and then go back to be go back to playing a peaceful game. You can build the Satraps Court in any of your cities to get that plus two happiness, and you can build the Dar Bimer, which is a unique version of the temple that yields plus two culture in the capital. This means that your capital will have a lot of extra culture, have a lot of border growth, be much more difficult to conquer. Because Persia's focus is almost entirely on getting happiness, the victory condition is very open-ended. You can use your early game combat units to take out barbarians and earn influence with city-states, or you can do some early game warmongering, take out neighboring enemies, build up your empire, but eventually you're going to want to settle down a bit and go for a peaceful victory condition, using your unique buildings to increase your happiness and your culture, and just improve your capital city. Carthage is well known to be a civilization that focuses on naval domination. They are definitely a seafaring civilization. They are also very good for early game domination, having a much stronger version of the trireme and the African forest elephant, which is a unique version of the horseman. As Carthage, you're going to want to settle almost all of your cities on the coast, and each city will get a free, unique harbor, the Cathon. The Cathon is a harbor replacement that gives much better trade and much better defense and allows you to build naval units faster. Their unique version of the harbor means that they will have a very powerful naval force, but they also have a very strong early game force with the African Forest Elephant and now the Numidian. If you're familiar with Carthaginian history, you know that they hired Numidians as mercenaries quite often. So you combine this Numidian, which is a ranged mounted unit, with your African Forest Elephant, which is a melee mounted unit, and you'll have a very strong ancient era land force. Combine that with your unique trireme and your unique harbor, which gives you bonuses to naval units, builds naval units faster, and protects your cities better, and you'll find Carthage to be a civilization that really excels at domination. But in terms of naval domination, England gives Carthage a run for its money. They have the Longbowman, which is a very strong version of the Crossbowman, because it can shoot three tiles instead of two. They also get the Ship of the Line, which is an even stronger version of the Frigate, and a Frigate is already a pretty, pretty effective unit. But despite having a lot of advantages for a domination victory, Elizabeth's AI prefers a diplomatic victory. So now she has two unique buildings that help her get that diplomatic victory. She has the Playhouse, which is a unique version of the zoo that not only yields two happiness, but plus two culture and plus one gold for every 10 citizens in the city. This means that you're gonna wanna have a zoo in your big cities because if they're populated, they'll, it'll earn a lot more gold. There is also the textile mill, a unique version of the factory that does not require coal. By not requiring coal, England might be the civilization that gets first choice of ideology because you will get all of your factories built before anyone else because they all require coal. She also gets plus two gold from dyes, silk, and cotton. With these new bonuses from these new buildings, you can use this extra gold to support your military, or you can use the gold to buy influence with city-states. 
domination or diplomacy, the choice is yours. Do what you want. Venice is a civilization that plays very differently from any other civilization because they can't build settlers and they can't annex cities. They can only puppet city-states and puppet conquered uh, cities that they take from rivals. Because of this, Venice is extremely vulnerable. If they lose their capital, they, lose pre they, they pretty much lose the game. So at all costs, this civilization needs to defend its capital. They have a unique version of the Galeus called the Great Galeus, which is very effective at defending territory. Because Venice almost always starts on the coast, and because almost every city-state has access to the coast, Venice wants to have domination of its coastline. The Great Galeus helps them do that. It will protect the capital, and it will help protect the city-states. There is now also a unique version of the garden called the canals. The canals do not require a river or fresh water like regular gardens. They require coastline, which means Venice can build the canals in their capital and almost every city-state too. Not only do they increase the rate at which great people are generated, but they also yield additional defense, making it so much better for Venice because they really need to defend their capital and city-states. Because they're going to be spread out so far, they're going to be even more vulnerable. So use those great galeuses and build those canals. They also have a unique version of the palace called the Doge's Palace. This palace is a little bit better defended than a regular palace, yielding five defense instead of two. This means that Venice isn't such an appealing target to any enemy civilizations in the early game. This building also yields plus three culture instead of plus one. Because Venice is at such a detriment in the early game, this compensates. Their borders will grow faster, they'll be able to choose policies quicker, and it's just a small bonus in the early game that allows Venice to build up a little bit of steam before it actually does its thing. Indonesia is a civilization that also does not really focus on any specific victory condition. They have a unique ability that allows them to get extra luxury resources, they have a unique version of the swordsman which gets random promotions, and they have a unique version of the garden which can be built anywhere and yields more faith depending on how many religions are in that city. So pretty open-ended. Their new trireme, the Kapal Jung, can actually go through deep seas from the beginning. Unlike most triremes, this trireme can go through the deep sea. It gets a movement penalty to compensate, but you can use this unit to find new continents to settle and get your new unique luxuries. Because the Kapal Zhang is one of the few units that can travel through deep ocean in the early game, this means that Indonesia will find a lot of city-states, find a lot of territory to settle, and probably be the first civilization to, cir to circumvent the world and discover every civilization. And in doing so, they can research printing press and get that extra delegate from being the first civilization to find everyone. You can also build a Wayang now. It's a unique version of the amphitheater, which yields more culture and generates great musician points. This is a pretty nice building for Indonesia because Gajamada's AI likes to go for a culture victory, so this helps them out with that a little bit. Again, Indonesia is very non-specific. They can build up their religion, they can build up their trade, they can use their Kapalajung to find city-states and build up diplomatic influence, they can use their Wayang to go for more cultural victories, they can really do whatever you want. India is a civilization that starts with a bit of a detriment. They have more unhappiness. But as they grow, and as their cities become more populated, that happiness penalty wears off, and actually gets reduced to amount where bigger cities are actually beneficial for India. Because they have a weakness in the early game, they also have a chariot archer replacement called the War Elephant. This helps them defend their territory and not be conquered immediately at the start. They also have a unique version of the castle, which they get near the middle of the game, that gives plus two culture and plus two tourism. India now also has a unique version of the musket man called the Sepoy. It comes with the siege promotion right off the bat. So you build a couple of these, you start attacking enemy cities, they, they, they'll they fall pretty quickly. India now also has a unique temple called the Mandir. It increases the amount of faith by three instead of two, making India more likely 
to get a religion, or at least have a stronger religious emphasis. The Mandir also generates plus one science for every five citizens in that city. So you want to have big populated cities that generate this science. India doesn't really have a specifically defined victory condition, but they are great at building large populated cities, and that lends itself to becoming a scientific civilization. So you combine that with the Mandir, which gives extra science and the large population that you'll have, and you can turtle up and win the science victory, but you could also do something else if you wanted to. Mongolia is a civilization generating Mongolia is a civilization that is focused on domination. Of that we can have no doubt. The best strategy for Mongolia is to wait until the medieval era when you have your Kashyyyk, your, your unique version of the knight that has ranged attacks. Using the Kashyyyk, you can generate great generals faster, your unique great general, the Khan. But in the early game, you really want to focus on improving your civilization. So we have a unique version of the circus now, called the Ger. With the Ger, your land units get an extra 10 experience. So combine that with the barracks, and maybe an armory, and you'll have a, you'll have a few well-trained units. Combine the Khan with the Kashyyyk, and you can take a couple of melee units and just start conquering. Because Mongolia is focused on warfare, and it's going to be denounced by civil, other civilizations, and because you're probably going to be attacking city-states thanks to your unique ability, it's going to be difficult for you to maintain a positive economy. So now they have a unique version of the stable that yields two gold. It also yields one horse resource, allowing you to build up your army. In addition, it also increases your land trade route. So you combine a yam with a caravansary, and your trade routes will be able to find somebody to trade with who's not hostile to you. In the end though, Mongolia is focused on using their mounted units for domination. Their two new unique buildings help them do that, and their two existing unique units are already doing that. So spend the early game building up your civilization and preparing for a mid to late game domination victory. Sweden is a civilization that almost always wins with a diplomatic victory. That is what their unique ability is focused on, getting influence with city-states and declaring friendships with other civilizations to generate great people. If a contender shows up for diplomatic victories, you can take them out with the unique rifleman and the unique lancer, which, which come about at roughly the same time during the industrial era. Their new unique temple is called the Stave Church, and it improves trade routes just a little bit. You combine that with your market, you send out your trade routes, you make some friends, you keep the peace, and you grow your capital. Sweden also now has a unique university, which yields plus two science from tundra tiles, in addition to plus two science from jungle tiles. Sweden is one of the only civilizations that has a tundra start bias. Russia also has a tundra start bias, but Russia actually gets rewarded from having a tundra start bias because they get double strategic resources. Sweden, on the other hand, has a tundra start bias and doesn't really have anything to offset that. But now with the Hoaxkola, you can get a little bit of science out of those tundra tiles and it will balance out just a little bit. In the end, when playing as Sweden, your best bet is to go for a diplomatic or science victory. Keep the peace, make declarations of friendship, stay in good with city-states, send out your trade routes, and just have fun. Ethiopia is a civilization that focuses on religion. They have a unique version of the monument that yields plus two faith. Combine that with a shrine, and you'll be yielding plus three faith in the early game. Which means that if the Celts aren't in the game, you're probably going to be the civilization that gets the first religion. Thanks to your unique ability, your troops fight better if you have a few cities. So Ethiopia is rewarded for building a few very populated cities. You want to go tall when you're playing as Ethiopia. One of Ethiopia's new unique components is a temple replacement called the Monolithic Church. It is a unique temple that increases religious pressure allowing you to spread your religion passively. If you combine the religious pressure from the monolithic church with the religious pressure from your grand temple, and you can passively spread your religion out pretty strongly. 
And that frees you up so you don't have to send out as many missionaries. You can use your faith to build religious buildings or anything else that you use your faith for. Their other new unique component is the Oromo Warrior, a unique musket man that gets a combat bonus on flat open terrain. It comes with Shock 1 and Shock 2 and it earns experience a little bit faster. The Oromo Warrior is a musket man replacement that upgrades to the unique rifleman replacement. So your Oromo Warrior, which gets bonuses on flat terrain, will upgrade to the Mahal Safari, a unit that gets bonuses on rough terrain. So by the time you have upgraded all of your Oromo Warriors to the Mahal Safaris, they will be a very, very versatile unit. They also have the near capital combat bonus. So not only do they have a combat bonus regardless of what terrain they're standing on, they will have a combat bonus if they're near your capital, and your capital will be very, very well defended. Again, Ethiopia does not have a very well-defined victory condition. They focus on religion, and they focus on growing tall populated cities. So you can go for a culture victory condition, or a diplomatic, or a science. It's up to you. Denmark is a civilization that is wholly focused on domination, their unique ability and two unique units are all focused on conquest. They now have two more unique components, one unit and one building to help them with their domination victory. Denmark's new barracks replacement is the Viking Longhouse. It is a barracks that yields plus two culture. It doesn't necessarily help with a domination victory, but that plus two culture can be used towards growing your empire's borders and increasing the amount of policies you have go down the honor tree faster if you will. They also have a longboat which is a unique trireme that is probably the strongest trireme in the game at 14 combat. It also comes with the mobility promotion which means it gets 5 movement instead of 4. What this means is you build your barracks and then you build up your army. You First you build a barracks, then you send out your triremes, look around, use that extra mobility to get a good lay of the land, and then you build your units and you start your conquest. You send your units over the water, you send them over the river, you send your berserkers out, you send your Norwegian ski infantry out. You just don't stop going for a domination victory. Denmark does not have a specific window in which it focuses on domination. They start with the trireme, buffed by the Viking Longhouse in the early game, then they get berserkers near the mid game and then they eventually get the Norwegian Ski Infantry in the late game. So you will never stop going for a domination victory. Arabia is a civilization that focuses on trade. Their, their caravans can trade farther, the trade routes spread religion faster, oil resources are doubled so you can trade them, they have the bazaar which gives them double luxuries to trade away, and they get more gold from oil and the oasis tiles. They also have a unique version of the knight called the Camel Archer, which is another ranged knight. You can use that to dominate your enemies, but more than likely you'll probably use that just to defend your home territory and defend your trade routes. The AI for Arabia likes to focus on religion, but really does not get a bonus to their religion because they came out before the Brave New World expansion. But now they also have a unique swordsman called the Ghazi. This is another unit that is good for defending your territory because it gets double defensive bonuses. So if you put them on hills or even jungle or forest tiles and just have them defend, they will be difficult to get through because they'll have an extra 15% combat bonus. In addition, you can station one of these units in your cities and great prophets and missionaries that come by will not be able to convert your city. They also have a unique university called the Madrasa, which yields plus four faith. Plus four faith is quite a lot, but then again, the, uni the university does come a bit later in the game, so that plus four faith will be beneficial for you. You might not necessarily have your own religion, but you'll definitely have an emphasis on using that religion. In summation, Arabia is a civilization that focuses on passive victory conditions and defending their territory. They will not go for a domination victory, but they will do pretty well when they go for a diplomatic victory and they can also go for a science or cultural victory as well. Ah, the Iroquois. Widely considered to be one of the worst civilizations in the game because of their heavy dependence on terrain. 
Their unique ability depends on having forests nearby to use as roads. Their unique swordsman, which does not require iron, which is nice, gets a combat bonus in forest and jungle tiles. And their unique workshop loses the production bonus, but gets plus one production per forest tile. This means that the Iroquois are pretty strong if they have forests nearby, but if they are unlucky and they get stationed somewhere with no forest tiles, they are one of the worst civilizations in the game. With the addition of the third unique and fourth unique component mods, they have the ability to plant trees. They can plant forests on any empty grass, tundra, or plains tile, which means they can take their empire, which might have been barren of any trees, or they can take an enemy's territory, which might also have been barren of any trees, and plant forest tiles throughout the entire thing, making it very well defended naturally, and giving them the bonuses that they so desperately need from forest tiles. The ability to plant forest tiles saves the Iroquois, because all of a sudden, their other unique components and their unique ability finally become relevant if they are unlucky. In addition, they also have a unique version of the Musket Man, which can move an extra space per turn and comes with the Siege Promotion. You can upgrade your Mohawk Warriors to Rushers and have them defend your territory pretty well, but they're also very immobile, and you can use them to attack enemy cities with great efficiency. The Iroquois really aren't focused on a domination victory. You can use your troops to conquer a couple of nearby cities, but your main emphasis is going to be on building your workshop, planting your trees, and getting a very productive civilization. You want to increase the amount of production you have in each city, and use that defensive terrain to turtle up and choose any of the passive victory conditions that you want. Probably culture, maybe science, maybe even diplomacy. Spain is a civilization that focuses on natural wonders. They get a bonus from natural wonders, and they have a unique version of the night which can settle on other continents. So if you scout out and you find a natural wonder, you can use your conquistador to settle on that continent and get that natural wonder for yourself. Isabella's preferred victory condition is domination, so you can use the unique musket man to start conquering enemy territory too. The victory condition that you go for when you're playing as Spain is heavily dependent on your, the natural wonders that you can find. If you are near the Great Barrier Reef, perhaps, that's a great way to go for a science victory because you get double science from that specific wonder. On the other hand, if you are near a religious natural wonder, you can settle there and get a whopping 10, 12 faith per turn from it, and you can just religiously dominate the world. Spain's two new components also do not lend themselves toward any specific victory condition. They have the bullring, which is a unique version of the zoo that spawns a cow tile, and every cow tile in that city yields plus two culture. It's a bit of a weird building that rewards you for having a lot of cattle tiles in your civilization, but plus two culture doesn't really mean much. You can try and use that to go for a culture victory, but it's nothing significant. Spain also has a unique garden replacement called the Mission. The Mission can be built in any of your cities and increases religious pressure, kind of like your Grand Temple. In fact, you can combine the Mission with your Grand Temple and really, really crank out that religious pressure. The Mission does not require access to fresh water like a regular garden, so you can build them in any city. In the end, Playing as Spain is always a bit of a gamble because you never know what your victory condition is going to be. It's very heavily dependent on what natural wonder you are closest to because if you can settle that natural wonder, it will probably give you a big bonus in one specific direction. And that is the direction that you will probably continue to go. Polynesia is a naval civilization. They get the ability to embark over oceans immediately, so they will probably be the first ones to find every civilization in the world and find some of the best locations to settle. They also have a unique improvement called the Moai Statues, and their land units get extra defense when stationed on these statues. This improvement can only be built on the coastline, one more reason why Polynesia likes to be on the coast. The Maori Warrior makes a great alternative to scouts. It is a warrior that weakens nearby enemies. 
So you send a bunch of these units out in different directions. They can embark immediately over the oceans and you try and find new lands to settle. Polynesia also now has a unique swordsman called the Koa. It also does not require iron and gets the amphibious promotion for free. One of the more fun components that Polynesia now has is a water mill replacement called the fish pond. Instead of needing rivers, it needs coastline. And instead of yielding two food and one production, it yields three food and plus one food from every fish tile. And it may create a fish tile nearby your city. This means that while Polynesia may not have a whole lot of production in the early game, they will definitely have a lot of growth. And all that extra food can be turned into a growing science victory if you so desire. So ultimately, Polynesia has a couple of advantages for every passive victory condition. It has the Moaia statues, which increase its culture for a culture victory. It can embark immediately and find every civilization in the world, giving it an advantage for a diplomatic victory. And it has the ability to grow big cities, thus lending itself to a science victory. So you can do a bit of early game domination with your two unique units, but ultimately you're going to want to turn that into a passive victory condition. Portugal is another naval civilization, and they're also heavily focused towards diplomacy. They have a unique ability and a unique unit that help them earn gold, which they could use for diplomatic influence. They also have a unique improvement that can only be built in city-state territory. So you'll want to stay in good standing with any city-states you find. Further emphasizing the Portuguese emphasis on trade is their new East India Company called the Casa da India. Because it replaces the East India Company, it can only be built in one city. So you want to put this in your most prosperous city, the one that's going to generate all of your trade routes. In addition to having a bunch of components and the ability that improve trade, they also now have a unique rifleman called the Cazador. The Cazador fights better on desert and plains terrain, not on tundra or grassland or snow. Ultimately, there aren't a whole lot of strategies you can use the Cazador for, but if you happen to find yourself in a land battle, depending on the terrain, the Cazador could give you a pretty big edge. When playing as Portugal, you're almost always going to go for a diplomatic victory, but you could also go for a cultural victory. That wouldn't be terrible either. On first glance, Austria might look like a good contender for a diplomatic victory, but because using your unique ability to annex city-states means that they lose their city-state status, if you abuse that ability, you're not going to have a whole lot of allies. Because of this, you're not so much going to go for a diplomatic victory, even though that's the AI's preferred victory condition using this civilization. You're better off going for a culture victory, or maybe even a science victory. You could also go for a domination victory if you wanted to. They have the Hussar, which is great for flanking enemy units. Not so much for attacking cities, but good for defending or attacking troops. They also have the Coffee House, which is a windmill that can be built anywhere and increases great people generation. So you combine that with a garden and you'll have a lot of great people. Because of this large increase in great people generation, it's probably best to go for a culture victory because you'll generate a lot of artists, writers, and musicians. To aid them in a culture victory, they now also have an opera house replacement called the orchestra. It's an opera house that has much more culture. So you build this in all of your cities, increase your border growth, and increase your culture. They also now have the Landwehr, which is a unique rifleman that fights better in homeland territory. Or it also fights better on hill territory. If you have hills in your territory, then this unit gets a bigger bonus. So station this unit on hills in your territory at strategic choke points, and it will be very, very difficult to take over your territory. All of these components combined make Austria a formidable culture victory contender. Their unique units are great for taking out any invading enemy forces, and you could turtle up and go for any passive victory condition. 
You can also use your unique ability to sabotage anyone else going for a diplomatic victory. The Aztecs are predominantly a domination and cultural civilization, mainly from the fact that they gain culture from each enemy unit killed. Your unique warrior, the Jaguar, is not slowed by forest or jungle terrain. It fights better in those kinds of terrain, and it heals when it kills a unit. So very early in the game, you'll be using your force of Jaguars to kill any barbarians or any neighboring weak civilizations. In fact, when playing as the Aztecs, you should probably never build scouts. You should always build Jaguars, which are always stronger, they will always be able to promote, and they aren't slowed by forest or jungle terrain. The only advantage that a scout has over a Jaguar is that it can move over hill terrain without having a movement penalty. But for every other situation, it's preferable to have a Jaguar. They also have the Floating Gardens, which is a unique version of the Watermill, that does not require a river. It can have a river or it can have lake tiles. The floating gardens are pretty effective, but very situational. If you have a lot of lake tiles, it's very good. If you don't have a lot of lake tiles, it's not as good. The bonus to food is okay, but as the Aztecs, you're going to be going to war a lot and you're not gonna really wanna have a whole lot of food growth or population growth in those cities. You want to have the cities keep a very small population. In addition to the Jaguar, they also now have a Spearman replacement, the Eagle. The Eagle can see farther and works as a sort of miniature great general, giving a bonus to any nearby fighting units. Now you might be thinking, why would I want to build an Eagle when a Jaguar is so, so very effective? Well, you're probably not going to want to build an Eagle. But if you do happen to encounter an ancient ruins, then that jaguar will promote to an eagle. So you will have an eagle that has been promoted from a jaguar. This means that you will have a unique spearman that has a bonus against mounted units, can see farther, gives a bonus to nearby troops, fights better in jungle terrain, is not slowed by jungle terrain. It is just a very, very powerful unit. If you don't get a random promotion from a jaguar to an eagle, then yeah, you should probably build at least one eagle because it works like a miniature great general. They also now have a sacrificial altar. It's a unique temple that just gives plus one happiness. Doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're taking a lot of cities, you're gonna have a lot of happiness penalties. You can use this to increase your faith and stay in a net positive happiness. Again, as the Aztecs, you start off right from the beginning doing a lot of domination. And you can continue that for a domination victory, or you can slow down and start turning that into a cultural victory. It's up to you. France, much like the Aztecs, is heavily focused towards domination and culture. They get a double theme bonus in their capital, so you're going to want to build very specific wonders in your capital, ones that have great works of art slot or great works of writing slot. You have a unique version of the Musket Man, which is just a little bit stronger, and you have the Chateau, which is a unique improvement that increases culture and gold generation. It also increases defense for any unit on that tile. By the time you research flight, these tiles yield plus three culture, and you can use hotels and airports to turn that into tourism and go for a very powerful cultural victory. The two new components that France receives encourage France to go for a wide domination victory. They get their foreign legion back, which gives them a foreign lands combat bonus, so they fight better in enemy territory. If you're wondering what happens with the volunteer army tenant of the freedom ideology, every other civilization now just gets generic Great War infantry. The foreign legion are specific only to France again. They also have a unique version of the zoo called the Salon. In addition to two happiness, they also get two science and two culture. So you want to build a lot of cities or conquer a lot of cities and build a Salon in each one. In summation, France is great for going for a culture victory. They don't have a whole lot of early game militant bonuses, but during the middle of the game they get the Musketeer and then their Foreign Legion, so you go for a bit of a late game domination. Take out any other contenders for a culture victory. 
Babylon is one of the strongest civilizations in the game because they have so much science generation. They get a free scientist early in the game and they can earn great scientists faster throughout the game, which means they are going to snowball pretty quickly. Their unique unit is the Bowman, which replaces the Archer, and it fights better and withstands melee attacks better. You can use that for offensive maneuvers, but it also works better as defending their territory, combined with the Walls of Babylon, which are stronger than regular walls. To fit in with this theme of defending your territory, they also now have the Charioteer. It replaces the horseman, and it can see farther, allowing you to scout out enemy units. With the Charioteer, you'll be able to see incoming attacks before they reach your territory, and you can set up for those assaults by preparing the Walls of Babylon and the Bowman. They also have a unique temple called the Ziggurat. In addition to the plus two faith, it also yields plus one production, and you build your buildings a little faster. Just a small bonus to help the already powerful Babylon build an even stronger civilization. Again, Babylon did not need a whole lot of bonuses to make it amazing. It was already one of the strongest contenders for a science victory. Japan is another civilization that focuses heavily on culture and domination, but much more for domination, not as much culture. Their most notable unique unit is the Samurai. It replaces the Long Swordsman and does not upgrade to Musketman, but instead Rifleman. Later in the game, they get the opportunity to build their unique fighters, which are called the Zero. The Zero does not require oil, so you can save your oil for other units that require oil. It also fights better against other fighters. Japan's two new unique components also help it go for a domination victory. They have the Dojo, which is a barracks that yields two culture and gives land units, aka samurai, 30 experience instead of 15. They also have the Sohei, which are warrior monks. They replace the pikemen, and they fight better when next to other friendly units. They come around the same time as the samurai. So you build a dojo in your city, and then you train these warrior monks and the samurai, and around the middle of the game, you send them out, and you do a whole lot of domination. And then you use the fighter to clean up any other civilizations that are still giving you trouble. And of course, Japan has the unique ability that all units fight at full strength even when damaged. So every aspect of the civilization focuses on domination. You get a bit of a culture bonus here and there, but it's mainly about domination. You can go for a domination victory, or you can just start conquering until you have enough power to go for a cultural victory. The Mayans are a civilization that starts off really well and continues to be well throughout the entire game. They have the unique archer called the Atlatlist, which is available sooner and can be built cheaper. They also have a unique shrine, which yields two faith instead of one, and two science, which means that as the Mayans, you're going to have a very early scientific advantage. The other new unique building that the Mayans get is the ball court, which is a Colosseum replacement. The only difference is that it yields plus one faith, but plus one faith in addition to the plus two faith from their unique shrine means that they will have plus three faith in the ancient era, nearly guaranteeing that the Mayans will get a religion. They also have the Obsidian Warrior, which replaces the Spearman. The thing about this unit is that it upgrades not to a pikeman, but to a long swordsman. But when it does so, it maintains its 50% anti-mounted combat bonus, which means that the Obsidian Warrior kind of works like a swordsman with an anti-mounted combat bonus. You don't have to split your army into the anti-mounted spear units and the regular melee sword units. You have both of them as one. Overall, the Mayans are a great civilization for really any victory condition. They have a couple of early unique units that help defend their territory, and then they build up their religion almost assuredly, and then they go for really any victory condition. The specific strength of the Inca is their ability to prosper in rocky hill terrains. Their units ignore the terrain costs when moving on to hill tiles, and they have no maintenance costs 
for roads that are built in the hill tiles. They have the unique terrace farm improvement, which allows them to extract food from these hill tiles, and they are much, much stronger depending on how many mountains are nearby. Ultimately, this improvement will yield anywhere between two and seven food on top of the two production that the hill tile already yields. So depending on your territory, you could have a large amount of food growth and be better ready for a science victory. They also have a unique archer called the Slinger, which withdraws from enemy melee attacks, making it really difficult to kill. They also now have a unique scout called the Chasky. It is a scout that also ignores terrain costs, but it moves three spaces instead of two. This is a pretty big advantage in the beginning of the game because if you build a couple of scouts, they can scout out all of the territory and grab a lot of ancient ruins, getting a lot of early game bonuses. They also have the Kurikancha, which is a unique temple that has no maintenance. Instead, it actually yields gold. The Incan victory condition is not well defined. You have a lot of defense because you have a lot of hills. It'll be difficult to take your cities. What you want to do with that advantage is up to you. The AI likes to go for a culture victory, but you can go for really any victory condition. Brazil is a civilization that really focuses on a culture victory condition. They are perhaps one of the best civilizations for a culture victory. They also strongly benefit from their golden ages. So you want to build wonders and build happiness yielding buildings to increase the amount of gold ages and the length of the gold ages that you get. The interesting thing about Brazil is that they have a jungle start bias and a lot of their unique components and their unique ability don't really become relevant until the late game. So they might seem a bit weak in the beginning. The jungle terrain that they will have in abundance does not lend itself to having a strong production. So finding early game production is vital when surviving as Brazil. But that jungle terrain proves itself to be a very strong natural defense. Once you get to the mid game, you can build the Brazil Wood Camp in the jungle. The Brazil Wood Camp is a very effective, unique improvement because it is built in jungle tiles and once you have built universities, it yields plus two gold, plus two culture, and plus two science on top of the plus two food. They also now have the Banderante, which is a unique musket man that heals faster and is not slowed by jungle terrain. Since you will have jungle terrain in abundance, this means it will be able to go through your civilization pretty quickly, even if you haven't built enough roads. It also means that you can invade nearby territory if they have jungle terrain without too much of a hassle. Because it heals faster outside of friendly territory, it is quite effective at taking enemy territory and fighting in enemy lands. It also upgrades to the existing Prasinha, which is the infantry that generates golden age points when it kills an enemy. It also maintains the bonus that it gets for fighting in the jungles from the Banderante. Brazil also now has a unique stadium called the Samba Drome. It yields plus four tourism in addition to the plus two happiness. Because their unique improvement and unique building all focus on generating culture and tourism, and because their unique ability and unique units are all focused on increasing their tourism as well, it is without a doubt one of the strongest cultural victory contenders. But if a cultural victory is difficult to obtain, you do start in jungle terrain, and jungle terrain is great for generating science. So culture or science, both are pretty useful for Brazil. The Shoshone are a very powerful civilization with no well-defined victory condition. They found cities with extra territory, and units receive a combat bonus when fighting within their own territory. They get the unique scout called the Pathfinder, which fights better than a regular scout, and you can choose what bonus you get out of any ancient ruins you find. This means that, combined with the unique ability, the Shoshone will have a very strong start. They also have a unique cavalry called the Comanche Riders, which is just a cavalry that can move farther. 
they now also have a unique improvement called the TP. You can build this pretty early in the game and it immediately yields plus one culture and plus one production. You can also build this inside forests without removing that forest terrain. It can only be built on flat plains tiles and it can't be built next to another teepee. So the amount of teepees you can build is fairly restricted, but you should build them wherever you can. Because you get another point of culture upon researching archaeology, the teepee will ultimately yield two culture and it would help you go for a culture victory if that's the victory condition you decide to go for. They also have a unique water mill called the Buffalo Pound. It does not require a river, but when you build it, it also spawns a bison tile. Any bison tiles in your city also get plus one food. Basically, this is a non-specific bonus. It increases the food and production of your city like a water mill, but also yields a little more food and maybe a little more production. Because three of the four components come in the ancient era, and because your unique ability gives you a bonus when settling cities and gives you immediate combat bonus when fighting in your own territory, the Shoshone are a civilization that focuses on getting a strong start. From that point, they can move on to any victory condition that they want to go for although a passive victory condition is preferable because they do get a combat bonus when fighting in their own territory as opposed to an enemy's territory. The AI likes to go for a culture victory, but a diplomatic victory or a science victory are both options you could choose. I should point out that with this mod, the Shoshone start bias is set to planes. They didn't have a start bias by default, but it was set to planes with this mod so they could build more teepees. Egypt is a civilization that is encouraged to build wonders. They get a 20% production towards wonder construction, and if you combine that with the Pantheon that increases wonder production, you can build wonders pretty quickly. They have a unique chariot archer called the War Chariot, which moves a little farther and does not require horses. They also have a unique temple that yields plus two happiness, the Burial Tomb. With this mod, Egypt's start bias is set to desert. They didn't have a start bias by default, but now they have a desert start bias. And you might be thinking, a desert start bias sounds pretty terrible. Desert tiles are very worthless. Yes, that may be true, but they have two new components that help counteract that. They have the Kopesh Swordsman, which is a unique swordsman that does not require iron and fights better in desert or flat terrain. This means that the Kopesh Swordsman will be very effective at defending your territory, especially if it's just a flat desert terrain. They also have the Nilometer, or the Nilometer. It's a unique water mill that increases the population of your city, plus 15% population growth. If you combine the Nilometer with an aqueduct, your population will grow very quickly. As a bonus, it also yields plus one gold from flood plains tiles. So settle on as much a desert as you can and get those floodplains tiles. Again, Egypt is not built for any specific victory condition, but they do benefit from having tall cities and building a lot of wonders. So a culture victory is preferred, science victory is also doable, and a diplomatic victory is not out of the question. Siam is a civilization that is heavily focused on a diplomatic victory. You get food, culture, and faith bonuses from friendly city-states, much more than any other civilization. You also have a unique version of the university called the Wat that increases the culture of a city by three. You also have the Narusan's Elephant, which is a knight that does not require horses and is stronger against other mounted units. With this mod, you also have the Ballista Elephant, which replaces the cross bowman and comes around around the same time as the Narusan's elephant. So you will have a melee elephant unit and a ranged elephant unit working together. The Ballista elephant can move three spaces instead of the cross bowman's two and has a better defense against melee attacks, as you would expect a mounted elephant Ballista to do. Siam so also has the Sala, 
which is a unique garden that can be built in any city. It doesn't have any different bonuses, but you can build it earlier in the ancient era instead of the classical era, so you can get your great people a little earlier. Siam is great for going for a diplomatic victory, but if that's out of the question, the culture you get from the Wat and the great people you get from the Sala mean going for a cultural victory is not out of the question either. And of course, mid-game domination with the Ballista and Narusan's elephants means you can take out any nearby competitors for your preferred victory condition. Korea, another one of the strongest civilizations in the game because they get so much science. They focus mostly on turtling up with their turtle ship caravels that can't really explore deep water but defend territory well. They also have a unique trebuchet called the Huacha, which is not really good for attacking cities, better for attacking invading enemy units. Korea gets two unique buildings with this mod, the first one being the Siyuan. The Siyuan is a unique university that yields to faith. As Korea, you're probably going to be rushing towards universities anyway, so that plus two faith is just a little bit of a bonus that you get for getting them. They also have a unique palace called the Changdeok Gunk. The Changdeok Gunk is a palace that just yields plus four happiness. That plus four happiness might not seem like a lot, but it is an immediate bonus that Korea gets, meaning they can settle their second city pretty quickly. Again, Korea was already one of the strongest civilizations in the game. They always, almost always, go for a science victory. They have a technological lead, meaning they can have first choice of wonders, so they could go for a culture victory instead if they wanted to. But they are really not focused on a domination victory. Any of the passive victory conditions are preferable over a domination victory. The Zulus are a domination civilization. I hope you're not surprised by this. Melee units cost half maintenance, they require less experience to earn their promotion, and they have the Impi unit. It is a unique pikeman that is one of the most powerful units in the game, especially when it's buffed by the Ikanda, the unique barracks that gives them unique promotions. If you've ever fought against Shaka, you know how terrifying those Impi invasions can be. They are very strong, they have a, a lot of promotions, and they are just really difficult to get rid of. But now they also get buffed by their unique Great General. The Izanduna is not that much different from a normal Great General, but in addition to buffing Shaka's troops, it also weakens nearby enemy troops. So not only will the Impi have a strong bonus, your troops will have a bit of a detriment. With all this emphasis on warfare, it's nice to have a unique building that does not specifically enforce your troops. The Isikathulu is a unique circus that gives you plus one production from every mineable resource in your territory. So if you have iron or coal or copper or salt, they're already giving you a decent amount of production or any of their other bonuses. And then you put a mine on it, it gives you plus one production. And then you build an Isikathulu gives you plus one more production. You can use all of this extra production to build more units and build a more terrifying army, or you can use it to just build up your civilization. The Zulus are a great domination civilization, but they don't really hit their stride until they get pikemen around the middle of the game. So you can start building up your military, start earning those promotions, and then once you have the MP, just go on a conquering rampage. The Ottomans are another domination civilization, and they focus on naval domination. All of their melee ships can capture defeated enemy ships, and they only, play, they only pay one-third the usual cost for naval unit maintenance, which means they will have a massive navy. But they also will have a strong army as well. They have the Janissary, which is a musketman replacement that heals 50 damage when it kills a unit. So it will be recovering every time it kills a unit. They also have a unique Lancer, which can see farther and move farther. So if you combine these two units together, they will be a very strong military force. 
And now, with this mod, they also get the Great Bombard. It is a unique cannon, and it comes roughly around the same time as their other two unique units. It has a 300% attack bonus against steadies, instead of the regular 200% bonus that a ordinary cannon has. So you use your ships to conquer naval territory, and you use these three land units to conquer land territory. You are definitely a domination civilization. You also have another unique garden called the Hammam. This garden requires fresh water, as does any regular garden, but it also yields plus two happiness, so you should build this in any territory that has the ability, because when you're dominating a lot of territory, you're going to have a lot of happiness penalties, and this will help offset it just a little bit. Byzantium is a civilization that didn't really fare so well when it was released. Its unique ability is that they benefit from a religion, but they have no guarantees to get a religion. Unlike the Celts or Ethiopia, they don't have any bonuses to faith, so their unique ability may end up being worthless. They have two unique units, the Cataphract, which replaces the Horseman, and the Dromon, which replaces the Trireme, so a couple of Unique early game units, good for early game warfare. The Droman is a ranged trireme, which means they can do damage to coastal cities, but can't really conquer them. But if you combine that with the Cataphract, you can do a lot of damage with the Droman, and then send in your Cataphract to take the city. It has a less severe penalty attacking cities, so that's a pretty good strategy. But in terms of getting a religion, Byzantium now has two unique buildings that help them do that. They have a unique temple which yields plus four faith instead of plus two. The temple comes a bit later in the game, so they may not have first choice of religion, but once they do get a religion, it'll be a pretty powerful religion. They also have a unique circus called the Hippodrome. It yields plus two happiness, and it also yields plus two culture and plus one faith, so you should build that in every city you can. It does require horses or ivory, like a regular circus, so you can't build them in every city, but that plus one faith, combined with the plus one faith from shrines, is very vital to Byzantium, and as soon as they get their religion, they can really hit their stride. America does not have any specific victory condition in mind. They have two unique units, the Musket Man, which fights better in rough territory, and the B-17 Bomber, which is better than the bomber it replaces. America also now has a unique stable called the Ranch. It gives them the plus one production from horses, cattle, and sheep, but also deer and bison. More importantly, it also increases the rate of border growth, so you don't have to rely on your 50% discount to purchase tiles you will gain those tiles quicker anyway. You also now have the steel mill, which is a unique version of the factory, which allows you to build tanks and naval ships faster. It also gives a small production bonus to iron and coal tiles. In the end, America can go for any victory condition that it really wants to. It gets a big bonus to production, but that can translate to building wonders for a culture victory condition, or building units for a domination victory condition. It's very open-ended. The Netherlands, the Dutch civilization. They are a seafaring and trading civilization. They have the Sea Beggar, which is a unique privateer great for attacking and stealing enemy ships. They now also have the East Indiamen to accompany them. They are a unique frigate that gets a unique bonus upon their first encounter in combat. This random promotion ranges from anywhere between nothing and 30% combat strength, which is a big increase. So if an enemy decides he wants to attack your East Indiamen, he might find himself in for more than he bargained for. And obviously you can combine these two units together and do ranged damage with your East India Man and then do melee damage with your Sea Beggar. They also have the Polder unique improvement which helps them get food 
from marsh and floodplains tiles. It's a pretty strong improvement, but you won't necessarily have a whole lot of those kinds of tiles in your territory. But if you do, the polder is a great improvement to build. They also now have a unique bank, which yields a little bit more gold and reduces the rate at which enemy spies steal technology. So if you want to maintain a technological lead, this building will help you keep it, especially if you combine it with the constabulary. All signs point to the Netherlands being a great diplomatic civilization, but they get a lot of food from their polders so they could go for science and then keep that technological lead with their unique bank. Or they can do some mid-game naval domination, taking the cities. The victory condition is, again, very open-ended. And finally, we have China. China is another civilization that had their start bias changed with this mod. They didn't have a start bias, and now their start bias is hills. And you might think a hill start bias is not that great, but they also now have the rice terrace. The rice terrace is kind of like the terrace farm that the Incans have, but it is not improved by having nearby mountains. Instead, if you have nearby fresh water, that is a river or a lake, then this becomes a very powerful tile. If you don't have fresh water, it's still a useful improvement to build. It yields food from the hills, but if you do have fresh water, it can yield eventually for food on top of the two production that the hills provide. Of course, they also have their unique library, the paper maker, which does not have maintenance and instead helps them yield gold. And they have the Chu Ko Nu, the cross bowman replacement which can fire twice in one turn, a very effective unit to have. Of course, they should be buffed by great generals that China gets with their unique ability. Their spawn rate of great generals is increased and they give a stronger combat bonus. If you put these great generals and these Chukonu on your hill tiles, your city will be very, very difficult to take. They also now have a unique caravel called the War Junk. The War Junk has a promotion that is kept even when upgraded. It gives them plus one movement, and it also gives them a combat bonus when defending, which means that your caravels will be much stronger. If you end up having some sort of coastline territory, the War Junk is a very effective defensive unit. It is a caravel that really takes a lot of effort to destroy. But you can also use it as a bit of a recon unit because it is a caravel, it can enter deep sea, and it does have extra sight bonuses. Overall, China is a great domination civilization. Only on land, not really so much for the seas. But you could also use their unique library to get a head start on a science victory. It is also supported by their new food generating rice terrace. It increases the population of your city, making it better for you to go for a science victory. And that's it. That was the entire thing. I hope this video gave you a little bit of insight into what these components do and why they do it. They are all designed to help each civilization improve their strengths or cover their weaknesses. Each component has a Civilopedia entry so you can click on it and read the history and why it was so important for that specific civilization. Now you might be asking yourself, can I still use other mod civilizations like the Sioux or Vietnam? or Canada? And the answer is yes. This mod will not stop you from using those civilizations. The obvious follow-up question is, will those civilizations have a third and fourth unique component? The answer is no. There is no way to give every mod civilization that has been made for this game a third component and fourth component. There's just too many. What I have done is made it so that every mod civilization gets the Palace Enhancements building for free in their capital. The Palace Enhancements building is a building that boosts food by one, gold by one, and boosts production by 5% and science by 5%.
You don't have to construct this building. It is available as soon as you settle your capital. The food and gold bonuses are great in the early game, but those production and science bonuses are great for the late game. Hopefully this will help compensate for the lack of additional components for these mod civilizations. And that is the third unique component and the fourth unique component mods. Thanks for watching this video. I hope it encouraged you to try out these mods. A lot of people worked very hard on them. And uh, have a good time. Enjoy your game.